Um, so next up, I was going to show you some examples of how I've, um, some of them quite recent, um, dealt with grading students' answers. And so when you get the student answer back, how can you check the properties of it? So I've got three examples to share with you. Um, and if I turn on screen share, um, I'll take maybe 10 or 15 minutes to do this and then hand over to Chris, who had some more things to say about debugging questions. Um, so if we're in the workshop page, you have access to this now too. I've just made this quiz available um, and I'll make the, the questions available for you as well so that you can play around with the source. So you can download those and have them as a wee early Christmas present. Um, so I've got three questions to show you. Um, the first two are about how to check the form of the student's answer. Um, so my first one here, I want them to write it in completed square form. Um, now this one is a sort of joke one because it's dead easy. Um, Chris has helpfully already prepared us uh, an answer test that does this. So if I look in the potential response tree, all I need to do is check that um, the student answer is in completed square form. So there is already a completed square answer test, which does that for me um, and will give helpful feedback. Um, I, I think Chris missed out mentioning that we now also have a shiny new website with the documentation. So as well as having your own copy of the docs on your own stack server, um, there is the new docs.stackassessment.org version of it. So it's all the same documentation for the latest version of stack pulled off of GitHub. Um, and the nice feature is it has a search. So we can look for answer tests and that will take me to the, the page all about answer tests. So you'll find completed square is, is one of the ones listed in here. There's quite a lot to, to dig your way through. Okay, so that was my you know, joke first one. Um, the next one is a bit harder um, and we're getting into complex numbers here. So this is one that um, bit me a couple of weeks ago in my course when we were doing complex numbers. Um, so we're giving them the Cartesian form and I want it in polar form. So something like this here, using the principal value of the argument. Um, and I prepared some slides for this actually, because it's just easier to step through. So that's my work solution. And based on what we've just been doing, I suppose you, you'll be able to afterwards critique that as to how well I've been doing solving problems at the level of the, the CAS rather than in LaTeX. Um, but to explain how, how I went through grading this. So the original version actually I discovered this year was broken. So I had students writing to me complaining that they were losing marks unfairly. Um, so the first issue is that I needed to turn simplification off in the potential response tree. So all of the, the grading code, I didn't want simplification to happen because um, Maxima would immediately simplify the, the student answer and turn it into Cartesian form. So it doesn't like the polar form and quite often was turning it into Cartesian form. So with simplification off, I can prevent that happening. So what the, the way the grading was working originally, I was taking their answer and looking, is it equal up to commutativity and associativity? And if it was, um, they basically agreed with my answer, they got, got the full marks. Um, if not, then I would check if their answer was algebraically equivalent. So is it the same complex number? And if so, that means they've given me the same complex number um, but maybe it was in Cartesian form, um, or maybe they've used the wrong print, the, the wrong argument, and they've added two pi to it or something. Um, so in that case, it's wrong and they lose all the marks. Um, if it's not algebraic equivalent, then I'll maybe check and see if they got at least the right argument or the right um, modulus and give them some partial credit. So the problem that I was facing was, say this is, this is our model answer, um, students who typed in the argument in a slightly different way were being marked wrong. And I, th I think that is a bit unfair. So I wanted to, to resolve that issue. Um, and the solution was to stick some code in the box at the top of the potential response tree. So there's a box there that lets you write some more Maxima code. And what I'm doing here is I um, take the, the student answer, answer one, 
and I'm going to replace all the, the cosines and sines with a version of it that Maxima doesn't understand. Um, so that's um, what Chris was just saying, an inert function. So Maxima is not going to tamper with those anymore. If I do that to my teacher answer as well, I can then expand everything out and if they've given the correct answer, things should cancel out. Um, and the nice thing about it is I can use evaluation with simplification turned on at that point, and it will cancel down all those fractions and things so that um, in this example here, these two would be seen as equivalent. So it would know to cancel those terms out. Um, and then it's just a matter of, instead of checking for equal up to commutativity and associativity, I just check that they're in the proper form. So using the, the thing that I've worked out in the code up above. Um, so regraded it and a few students got the marks for that and were, were happy. Um, and I did, at the moment, I did that. I wrote up a little blog post just to remind myself of what I did. Um, okay, um, another example that I wanted to show you because I've, I've got quite into getting students to generate examples of things. Um, so rather than just here's this thing do a calculation, can you give me an example of something with certain properties? Um, and that somehow turns the challenge over to me to check have they given an example with the right properties. Um, so that's where you have to do a bit of work with Maxima. Um, so an example of that was underground mathematics, this, this website with lots of tasks for A-level. Um, I was using some ideas from that previously and you know, getting students to work on these problems in groups. And this year I wanted to transform those into um, online tasks with feedback from Stack. So here they're trying to fill in the boxes of this table. Um, first of all, they've got to work out in this problem what the various properties are that they're trying to satisfy in the different columns and rows. Um, so that's a model solution from the, the underground math site. Um, so looking at, say, this cell in particular, that's one that I'm going to focus on in a minute. Um, they need to find a function which has a local minimum with y coordinate 1. So that's quite a, an interesting, unusual property. Um, so I turned this into a sequence of stack questions. So first of all, they had to figure out what the properties were in the columns and rows. Um, and then there were some questions asking them what's something that could go in this box, um, what's something that could go in this box, and so on. So I'm going to go through how to, to figure out is something a correct answer to a, a polynomial that could go in box A. So I've got two things to check there. I want it to have a stationary point at a certain place, and I want it to have a local minimum with y coordinate one. Now it just so happens that these kind of help each other out. Um, but in principle, if this was randomized, they, they could be quite distinct properties. So first of all, to check, does it have a stationary point at one one? Um, so I, well, before I start, I want to make sure that the types in a polynomial, because the, the problem asks them to, to write in polynomials. Um, and that makes my job a bit simpler that I only have to deal with potentially quite nice functions. So the first thing I want to check is if I differentiate their answer and then plug in the x value of the, the stationary point, I should get zero. So that's showing that they've got a stationary point with the right x value. And then I want to make sure that that stationary point goes through the correct y value. And then I need to check the other property. And that's a bit more complicated. So again, I went to the, the box above the potential response tree and had to write some code for it. Um, now I should say, actually, this was written for me by an undergraduate student who we had as an intern over the summer. Um, so I'm grateful to them for figuring this one out. So how to find whether it has a local minimum with y coordinate one. Um, so I'm going to use this programming trick of setting a variable that's going to hold whether or not it's true, and I'm going to do some stuff. So it starts off being false, and if they do manage to show to me that they've got a local minimum with y coordinate one, that flag will become true. So first of all, I, I make sure that it's a polynomial, um, and then I'm going to use a block. So if it is a polynomial, I'm going to do everything in this block of code. Um, first of all, I'm going to find where their function hits the y value that I'm interested in. So using the maxima function real roots, I'm going to solve that polynomial equation. 
what that's going to give me back is a list. So I've got a list of x values where their function passes through, in this case, y equals 1. And now I want to go through all of those points and figure out, is it a local minimum there? So we've got a list of things, and I want to check a property at each of those points. Um, this should be reminding you of something that Chris was talking about. It's an opportunity to map. Um, so here you're seeing some of the stuff in action that Chris was talking about. So this is going to give me, I'm going to take my, my list of x values, and for each of those, decide a true-false value. So is the derivative vanishingly small, so essentially 0, up to the, the kind of error that I might be dealing with floating point numbers here. Um, and is the second derivative positive? So I've got a local minimum there. So for each of my x values that I found, um, I'll get that true or false. And then my has local minimum is going to be using this um, other maxima function, which Chris has written, any list p. So given a list of trues and falses, this will tell you if any of them is true. So that should overall tell me if any of the intersections with y equals 1 is a local minimum. And that's me done. Can I ask a question, George? Sure. What's the difference between map list and map? Um, Chris might need to help me out here. I did notice that earlier. I think map would do in this case, but am I right in thinking map list would be okay if, if x values wasn't a list? Um, right, so let's have a quick look at the docs. Um, because I can't remember. I think map list returns a list, doesn't it? Is that right? Yeah, so you, you could use map list on something like a plus b plus c, and it would would map onto the arguments of it. Yeah, so map list always returns a list. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could have used just map um, in the case um, they're equivalent. Have you uh, had any student submit a solution with uh, uh, that is uh, with x to the four? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting thing. I think um, looking at the, uh, there were, this was a group activity, so there were only about 20 responses from different groups, um, and they were all the kind of simplest one that you could imagine. Um, so there were no exotic answers there after, after all that effort to going out, going to figure out in the general case whether the answer was correct. Um, but yeah, you've got access to the question now, so you could, could try and break it, find examples that um, you think should get the marks, and I'll try and regrade it. If I, if, I, if I put something in that has zero second derivative, then you're not going to catch that, are you? Um, yeah, I guess. So... That was going to be my question as well. If you put like yeah. x to the 4 plus 1 or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think I've probably got Chris's voice ringing through my ears at this point. Some of these problems are essentially unsolvable. Um, so, the, you know, there would come a point where I could maybe just, you know, keep taking derivatives and keep taking derivatives, but at some point I'm not going to be able to solve this in general. Um, so this is a, a kind of tension that I'm interested in is the extent to which I can grade the, the answers that students are likely to give me. Um, knowing that, you know, as a human, I could look at their answer and figure out the weird case that might come up every so often. Um, but with Stack, you've kind of got to think about it in advance. Okay. Any other questions about what I was talking about? Um, I've got a potentially slightly related question um when you there's been times when i've been trying to construct questions and you have say a bunch of random variables and you spot as you go through um that actually a particular combination of those gives you a question you, you know you're not going to want now that there's probably much more clever and subtle ways of uh, setting up those random variables in the first place to make sure that doesn't happen but it struck me that it would be useful and i it's really a question whether this does exist uh, if you could sort of say if you just have some sort of test in there that says actually if you 
if when you do all your random generation, you end up with this combination, don't even bother to evaluate me as a, a variant. Because what I tend to end up doing is, do, uh, is deploy a whole lot of things and then get rid of the ones that I don't want. Uh, but it would be, I sort of know ahead of time, oh, there's going to be a few that pop up that I'm going to have to get rid of. Is there something, some sort of feature like that? Um, yes, yeah, so I've used that sort of hack um, where... I mean, it, it is a hack, isn't it? Yeah, so you can add something to your potential response tree that checks the property you want. Um, so, if, you know, suppose you've got your random versions that A, B, and C are random numbers, um, but maybe you want them all, um, you don't want the case where they're all positive, say. I don't know. So you add something. Sure, all like them. all the same or something like that yeah. that would break it all. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good example. So say you didn't want A, B, and C to be the same, or you could be clever and actually use the randomization to functions to, to achieve that at the outset. Um, but just as a toy example, in your potential response tree, you could assign a grade essentially for is the, um, the size of that set three um, and make add a, a question test, um, an answer test, which will fail. I'm not, ex not explaining this well, but I've done it in the past where I, you essentially add a test case that will fail um, so that those questions won't be deployed. I'll, I'll look out the example um, and share that with you in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, Patrick, um, this is a good opportunity to encourage people to raise issues on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub Maths, um, I'll post a thing in the chat, um, and go to, this is, this is the home of the stack project on, on GitHub. You can put feature requests and things like that as an issue. You can raise an issue and we'll discuss it. Um, especially if you find yourself, as you've just described, fighting against the system. Because I certainly wouldn't behave like that. I would just write the code and fix it. Now, there's a finite amount of time I've got to write code for other people and fix problems that I'm not having. And I don't mean to be rude, but um, there just is. But what we, what, what we should be doing is, is coming up with a, a solving things in a sensible way. So I've always tried to solve the problems at the mathematical level, right? I mean, that was, and what George did with his sine and cosine, creating this inert function, um, what he's essentially doing is switching simplification off for just the sine and the cosine function. All the other simplification rules are now back in play. And you often have to do that. Um, you often want to, to have a selective set of simplification rules. The fact that George's didn't work is because the equal up to commutativity and associativity is just that. It's equality up to equality. In, it's a, it's, a, it's a, um, an equivalence class up to commutativity and associativity. So George, George's one times pi over three will not simplify one times pi to pi because that is not commutativity and associativity. That's using the fact that one times X is X, which is a different rule, right? So George somehow wants that rule back in play. Um, right. uh, so I've had lots of situations where it would be very useful to have a simplification set up where there, the only simplification that's done is commutativity, associativity, and a whole bunch of um, units. So zero plus one times to the power of one, right? There's a kind of bigger equivalence class there, and that would be very useful. But it's only by raising, raising these kinds of um, feature requests and then discussing what's really underlying the feature request and thinking about how we could solve that problem properly rather than making the problem go away. Right? I mean, George made his problem go away, but there might be a different way to, to expand the range of what Stack is designed to do that will solve a whole bunch of other problems. Um, in an elegant way. And that's what I would like to do. But it does need some discussion and some thought, actually. Um, I, I have did one with, with the deploying variance thing. We've got a longstanding feature request to sy systematically deploy all the variants that are implicit in your randomization. Okay, so if you've got RAND 10, there will be 10 variants, right? So we should systematically deploy all of those. So that's a longstanding request. Be kind of fun to code that up, actually. But and um, how we would exclude certain random variants from ever being deployed. Um, I mean, the, the problem I have with all of this is getting colleagues to deploy things in the first place. 
I mean, three weeks ago, I spent a very miserable afternoon figuring out how to deal with a live quiz because one of my colleagues in Edinburgh had not put in an answer test that correct whether the correct answer was correct, right? And so when the randomly generated matrix was singular, it created all sorts of havoc. Whereas if you just put in a single answer test, um, sorry, a single, a single question test in, in the question testing framework, then that would have been spotted straight away. Um, so it's where I put my effort really on those when, I, when it comes to those kinds of requests. I guess but, maybe, maybe, sorry. Yeah, please raise issues on GitHub. So there's a question from Sam. Um, so how, how is that different to just not setting any deployed variants? Doesn't it just then generate an example at runtime? Yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. But then you're very much in the lap of the gods, aren't you? It's much better to, to pre-generate your variants and test them all. And then you can be assured that your students will see questions that operate according to your tests. And that's really useful. So the feature request is essentially just letting you run the unit tests against all possible. I was talking about that feature request you just mentioned. That you said long-standing feature request. No, the long-standing feature request is to automatically deploy the variants looking at the randomization that you've put in your question. Um, you can run all the, all the question tests on all the variants that are deployed. Um, I'm not understanding something then. Uh, that, that was what I meant though. If you, what's the difference between automatically deploying everything and just letting it pick one, just deploying nothing? Sometimes you can't deploy everything. Like, let's say quite often I have run, I don't know, three plus five and run another three plus something. So I know I, have, I, I, I can deploy up to nine variants and for some reason it deploys eight. And every time I try to find the last one, and let's say I tell it to deploy other 10 and other 10, and I try to, to deploy like a, a very awful number, it never gives a ninth back. But uh, Sam, I think you're right. The difference is that when you deploy everything, you are running the question tests over everything you, that you deploy. And if you're going for runtime generation of variants, then you're not running question tests. I mean, if, if a lot of my time continues to be used up, retrospectively fixing problems that should have been spotted in advance. I will just change the design and you won't be able to use a question with random versions unless you deploy, right? I mean, I could very, very tempted to do that, um, but it would just annoy people and it would make testing questions more difficult. Um, so there's a subtlety between, yeah, between those decisions, I think. I mean, I'm very, well, it's, it's our software, right? I mean, there are three of us who've written, read every line of code. So it's sort of not up to me to make completely unilateral decisions. And we should discuss and agree what we actually want and we'll try and get it. That's, that's part of the open source thing, isn't it? So. I, I guess maybe a, a better phrasing of my question would have been, let, let's say you know that you want three random variables, but you don't want them to all be equal, for example. Is there a standard approach for um, setting that up? Um, right. So what I would do, Patrick, is structurally in my question variables, not let that happen. So I would define A to be a random number between 1 and 10. And then I would define B to be A plus 1 plus something else. And then they can't You can be. use rand with pro, rand with, rand with prohibit, which I yeah. use it all the time. That's my favorite rand. So my, my approach is to be definite uh, and to avoid it happening rather than just leave it to the lap of the gods. Um, yes, that makes sense. Prohibit the one you've already, that you've already generated. Yeah. But, you know, if you're randomly generating matrices with integers in and you want it to be non-singular, it's a bit more subtle, isn't it? But that, my approach doesn't always work. It's not that simple. Um, yeah. If you take a matrix and check whether the determinant is zero, and if it, if determinant is zero, then change the bottom right hand element by one or something yeah absolutely and it doesn't always uh, work yeah okay george thank you that was really helpful um those examples um so there are a few things that i wanted to just say 
Thanks for highlighting. I was going to come back to documentation, and I do want to thank Martha for setting all that up. The, the new documentation with the search function is a major improvement. Um, and it's a major improvement because when we update the GitHub site, it automatically updates the website. So you, it is the very latest documentation. The only downside of that is you may not have those functions on your server yet because it's the latest thing. So that's the only downside of the, the documentation. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the sandbox. Um, so what you can do if we go back to sharing my screen. Um, do, 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 do. So where is the docs? Here are the docs. And if you come into the uh, documentation and we go to um, CAS and there is this sandbox thing. <clears throat> so the idea of the sandbox, and I'll show you, I've got it all set up here, is that you can use desktop Maxima and it will load, um, it will load all the files that I've written, right? So this stack maxima.mac is the file I've written. Um, uh, the problem with this is, one, you have to download the um, code from GitHub. So if you go to GitHub Maths Qtype stack, you can just download the code. Um, you can download a zip, but I recommend you learn how to use Git because then you can keep your code up to date very easily. So you can either just download it once and you won't get the update, so you can, or you can have, um, have Git to check it out. And then inside there, under stack, all the Maxima code is literally in here, right? It is, this, is, this is the Maxima code. So if we go to assessment.mac and look up uh, zip with, this is the code. This is, zip, this, is, uh, this is the code I wrote to create that zip with function. It's really not very deep, right? If it's not a list, then you to return false. And if it's empty, you return false. Otherwise, you apply the function to the first elements and then recurse over the rest of it. So I mean, that's it. Um, so all the code that I've written is in here. Equation P that I demonstrated earlier is in here. If it's an atom, then it's not an equation. And if the operator is the equal sign, then it is an equation. Again, it's not, that's all it is really. Um, yeah. So that's where the code is. So you can get hold of the code and then um, you can use the sandbox. So I started the sandbox here. And the big advantage of that when you're debugging questions, if we go back to our um, site home, I'll come into the demonstration quiz and go back to my demonstration question here. If you come to the question testing page, here are our deployed variants. You can actually now cut and paste things from the question testing page to see what's really going on. So you can actually play around with the code that is executed. This is the code. This is the code that the website sends to Maxima, right? I'll just get rid of the answer here. Chris, we can't see what you're doing. Oh, why not? Have I stopped sharing? Sorry, folks. I've gone into the question testing page, and if you cut and paste, this code, you can then cut and paste this into the desktop version of Maxima. And if you execute that, that is literally the code that is sent to and from Maxima. So you can actually see what's going on inside your question and you can debug it in a desktop session. And that's sometimes very, very useful. Um, this page, this page exposes an awful lot about your question. What's going on inside your question? At the bottom of this page is the work solution. So if you, if you actually just go to one of these, you come through when you, when, you, when you preview the question, you come through to this page and people still play about with this, but I very rarely play about with this. I go straight to this, this page. We've exposed the work solution at the bottom. Um, we expose the question variables and all their values and the potential response trees in a way that you can um, you can cut and paste this straight into the Maxima desktop like this, right? And it, I mean, this is a bit cryptic because we have to protect strings back through the PHP code to get to the screen. But anyway, um, so it's, it's perhaps the, not the most user friendly thing to use. But if you, if you are writing a lot of stack questions and if you really want to see what's actually going on, then there is full transparency there. 
Um, so please take advantage of that if you're getting stuck. Um, and that, yeah, and th the difficulty is that setting Maximus path is a bit of a pain and you've got to download various things and play about with it. So if you're interested in that, I'd, I'd be happy to, um, I'd be happy to, um, to help people with that. Um, how did I get it to pay for the line breaks? I don't know, control C, sorry, Sam. Um, that's not a problem I've got. Uh, that was all I wanted to say, really, other than to thank you for your interest. We've got a few minutes of questions and answers, and I'm not, I'm not going to rush off at five if people still have questions. Um, George Malta, do you want to say anything? Constantina? I had one thing, maybe going back to Patrick's question. I've dug out the question that I had in mind. So, yeah, so I agree with Chris absolutely about being rigorous, about randomising. Um, but the situation that arose for me was, um, I'll share my screen to show you. So it was a question, this one here. So I'm generating this graph um, in JSX graph and getting to work out some areas. Um, the issue was, so I'm going to generate this polynomial, but I don't quite know what the graph is going to look like of the polynomial and how extreme it's going to be. Um, and I didn't really want to have to think it through, like, you know, which routes should I choose and which y-intercept should I choose so that the graph is going to come out looking nice. So all I did was, um, after I've done all my randomization, um, I work out the bounding box of the graph, because I need to work that out to tell JSX graph what to plot anyway. Um, and what I do is I work out the ratio. So if, if I'm ending up with a really tall, thin graph, I don't want to, students to see that. Um, so all I've done is added into one of the potential response trees, um, is that ratio okay? Um, so I've you know, defined that up above. And if it's not, then I'll get this um, zero marks and I'll fail the, the test. So that version will never be deployed. Um, that was just because I got sick of going through the list of deployed variants and looking at all the graphs and seeing which ones look nice. Um, so there is that, that's a little trick if you want to make things deliberately fail a test so that they'll never be deployed. That's very helpful. Thank you, both of you. I hadn't thought of doing that, George. That's very interesting. <laughs> it was fascinating to see what other people do. Um, I mean, is that logically the right place to do it? I mean, we could add a field to the whole data structure, to, but then there's a lot of upkeep in that. That might get us, that might actually just do. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember reading that trick in the docs, George. <laughs> So uh, please, okay, folks, if you, so firstly, like, I guess, if you find yourself doing something really un unnatural, if, it, if this feels completely the wrong approach, then ask, because either we've, we've got a better way to do it or we'll have to find a better way to do it. Um, and, and then please write stuff up and contribute it back. Um, right. Can I do a little bit of housekeeping before we end up? Um, I was just going to say that if you go back to the workshop page, let me find it up, that uh, first of all, I'll, I'll upload the recording from this session, put it here if you want to, to look back on any of the things we've talked about. Um, and the other thing is that we have a, a feedback um, this feedback form here at the end, I'll make it visible just now. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out at some point, that would be really helpful for, for future workshops. Okay, and I'll say um, thanks to, to Chris and George. Um, Sorry, there is one question on the chat. Yeah. So, yeah, so Bjorn is saying, could you explain the testing? I get the replay, too many repeated existing question notes were generated when automatically deploying number of variants. So the, there's a kind of Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo the right word. There's a, when, we're, when we're creating new variants, we just look at the answer notes to see if the question appears to be new or not. So question variants are the same if and only if the notes are the same. 
So the question note is used to determine that. And when you say you want 10 new variants, at some point it has to give up. The system will just will say, I haven't been able to generate any more. Otherwise it would go into an infinite loop, right? If you want 10 more, let's say you've only created rand one to five, and then you say you want 10 variants. It can't create 10 variants. There aren't 10 variants, but there's no way for the system to know that, right? So it just keeps trying to create a new random variant to deploy. And then at some point it says, all right, I've had too many repeated answer notes. I'm going to quit. And this is what people were talking about with the um, systematic deployment of every variant you've created, right? So it would then loop across to make sure that you get all the variants that exist because it can be annoying if you really want all, you've programmed in, um, you know, there's a very low probability of this, but let's say we've got a list with two objects, sine X and cos X. You definitely want both of those to be available but it just never gets round to giving you an even number. So you never get the cos X version, right? You only get an odd one, so it's a sine X version. So you just are annoyed that you never actually see that. And we would want to systematically go through the list and deploy them. Um, well, um, we just don't, we, we have no way of, all, of systematically deploying all the random variants at this point. So that's what the oh, that's what the uh, that's what the automatic that's what the uh, too many repeated existing question notes means. The system's given up to prevent an infinite loop. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, yes, that answers the question. A uh, question from Igor. Um, Semi-automated parser. Yes, you should use the um, Q-type uh, pattern match. So the Open University have a P-match question type, which is exactly designed for uh, semi-automatic parsing of short textual inputs. Stack is the whole point of Stack is that the answer should be a computer algebra expression. So the answer to that question is to use the question type that's designed for that job. I put that in the bracket of why doesn't Stack do chemistry? Sorry, uh, Igor, I don't mean to be rude, but um, you can't make a dog meow, can you? All right, thanks everyone. Um, have a good evening and happy stacking. <laughs>